Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company and thank you so much for tuning into our live Q&A for Relic this evening. Um, I want to thank IFC Midnight Films for co-hosting this with us and our wonderful partners at North Bend Film Festival as well, um, who are also co-presenting it. Uh, it's a wonderful film festival which takes place just outside of Seattle in the town where Twin Peaks actually was filmed originally. Um, and they focus on really great and unusual genre storytelling throughout the, the festival circuit. Um, please stay tuned to their website and check it out for more information on what they're putting together for an amazing virtual experience this coming October. And also North Bend are a nonprofit, so please check out their website. Um, and their there should be a link popping up in the chat box in case you're willing to donate if you have a wonderful time at this Q&A hosted by them um, that Jess Byers, who's one of the co-founders of the festival, just shared with you all there. Um, as a reminder, there is a Q&A box in the bottom corner of your screen. So if you have any questions for our panelists this evening, please feel free to submit those and we'll try to get to a couple of those at the end. Um, and without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the wonderful Natalie Erica James, who's the director and co-writer of Relic, along with Bella Heathcote and Robin Nevin, the cast members. Hi. Hi, welcome. Whoop. Thanks for having us. I know, I was gonna say thanks for joining uh -oh. us tonight, but I know it's it's early morning for you guys. Not too early, it's 10 a.m. It's very respectable. <laughs> That's kind well, of I wanted to jump yes, in by asking you, Natalie, a little bit about the genesis of the film, because this was based a lot on your own personal experience of not having gone to visit your grandmother in Japan for several years. And then when you did, just realizing how much Alzheimer's had really taken from her and the, and the emotional and mental state that she was in at that point. And I was curious in the way that that personal experience really seeped into the way that you wrote these characters and their linkage with each other. Yeah, I would say that the, you know, the emotion of guilt um, that kind of, you know, started the genesis of the idea, as you've said, um, definitely colors uh, the way the characters kind of relate to each other, uh, particularly in Emily's character Kay, um, and you know the sense of responsibility um, that she obviously holds in the film, and the the real sense of uh, falling short or not being there for the people that you love. Um, and I think that's one of the main kind of arcs in the film, um, and the. I guess transformation that she she goes through through that experience so it was definitely something that was forefront in our minds in writing it yeah and then bella i love the way that you spoke about how when you first read the script that you found a lot of emotional connectivity between these characters which really often doesn't exist specifically within the horror genre and i was curious about what those specific beats were with your character and her relationship with her mother and her grandmother were that you found that really jumped out on you the first time you read it I just liked that the relationships were messy, uh, particularly the, the mother-daughter dynamics. They, they were complicated and uh, yeah, I found that appealing because I feel like there's something, I mean, it, less so now, but it used to be that when I read a script, the female characters, it's like, they didn't trust that the audience would go along with these women if they weren't, I don't know, perfect or if their likeable. relationships weren't perfect. Yeah, likeable, they had to be likeable and mother-daughter dynamics had to be really, um, I don't know, bullshit, basically. Uh, and that was something like, you know, if they had complicated relationships, what we're not going to feel for them when they get lost in the labyrinth or something. Um, and I just love that this, that wasn't the case in this, but that the grandmother, granddaughter dynamic was so different to the mother daughter dynamics. It really was. That's interesting that that comes up. Sorry, I was just going to say, because I, I remember getting some feedback uh, in the process of mm. writing the script and, you know, shopping it around about Kay not being likable enough. Yeah, see, uh, what is that? And then, of course, she's played by, like, arguably the most likable actress in the world as well. I know. So, um, yeah, no, it's an interesting observation, yeah. Yeah, and for you, Robin, there's such an interesting dynamic in the way that you craft the, the different types of relationships that Edna has both with her daughter and with her granddaughter, because obviously they're very different dynamics. You know, one is someone that she's had to be a disciplinarian to, the other person is someone that she's been able to just be there for emotionally. So I was interested in the way that you really wanted to construct what those two different relationships were going to be and how even though it's within the same family, they would be so different. Well, it came quite naturally to me, I think. <laughs> Um, you know, I have a deep understanding. I've lived a long time and I've known a lot of familial relationships and I have a daughter myself and I have a grandchild myself. And it, the writing is very true, it's very clear, it's very honest, uh, unsentimental, uh, ultimately, uh, which is, I think, you know, keying into what Bella was saying. 
um, about it being messy and uh, truthful and difficult, awkward and unpleasant, nasty, all of the things that, because there's so much baggage that's, that's been pi uh, piled, piled into these lives as they've been lived, you know, they're, she's old, Edna's old and Kay's middle-aged and Bella's young, but even Be Bella's character has even, um, she's, she's gathered a lot of kind of messy living along the way. So the three of them together, they, they offer a very complex picture of life lived, life as it's been lived and life as it's being lived. So I don't know, I found it quite, um, uh, nothing's easy, acting's not easy, uh, but, but t I, I found it logical and clear and truthful. So that, that's the best kind of script you can have to work with. Yeah, I remember Robin, I, I hope you don't mind me saying um, that you wrote a, a letter as Edna to Emily's character, Kay, as well. Oh. And um, so, you know, that was kind of in the, preparation so obviously a lot of thought went into that um the history of their relationship i've completely forgotten that i don't don't think yeah. i have i don't gather yeah, things you, i'm a bit of a role yeah, you so sent it to me so i'll i'll, I'll yeah. keep that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think those, yeah. I think those things are really i think those things are really useful per, mm. a person like a, a letter yeah i'm glad i did that good i hope it helped <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And then, you know, kind of looking to those relationships for you, Bella, I was interested if you kind of looked to the way that Robin and Emily were playing their characters to develop some of the characteristics of who Sam was going to be, thinking about who she would be both genetically from then, but also just growing up, you know, particularly with Kay as her mother, what she would have adopted in terms of her own characteristics into herself. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so, actually. I don't think I did because, you know, we discussed a lot that uh, Kay wasn't really there in Sam's childhood. I think that was the backstory that we came up with, that she wasn't around much and, um, you know, that's why, part of why Sam resents her so much. Um, yeah, there no, was kind I, of a history of, of uh, a slight, uh, a period of abandonment and that kind of, I guess, fed into why she was so frustrated by her mother's actions towards Edna as well. Yeah. Yeah, then, so, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's the answer. This is, we shot it like a year and a half ago, two years ago, so, you know. No, but yeah. this is also me going, mm, maybe I should have done that. That probably would have been a better, better uh, acting choice but, to uh, but, think about the... Me. But, but maybe that was just an organic absorption process that you weren't aware of. That can happen too. Totally. I mean, I do feel like Emily, as soon as I met her, we just became like two peas in a pod. And Robin and I definitely like had a solid bonding experience prior to Emily getting there. So I feel like maybe you do do that. Like I know that every job I've ever done, I've picked up some sort of characteristic from the lead of the job. Like uh, Lily Jane snorts when she laughs. So I started doing that. It's really quite quite creepy actually it's, I sound like a white female but then like you know a friend of mine on another job says she says lol but I was like you know oh lol and then I just, so maybe I, I'm sure that I picked up characteristics of Robin and Emily just like the creepy stalker I am it's such a modern story isn't it I mean uh, just hearing that hearing you talk about the abandonment issues they all have abandonment mm. issues the three generations are so three women all have abandonment issues not to mention the the person in the cabin uh and and it's it that seems to me such a contemporary issue a contemporary problem absent fathers absent mothers children mm. are absent because they're on devices all day you know it's really mm. interesting i think yeah and it's really beautiful natalie the way that you manifest all of that into your characters and particularly use that as, as a tool within the genre um you know one of the things specifically with horror is kind of almost constructing the rules of the world that you're going to create because it is a little bit supernatural so how did you kind of map out what edna's journey was going to be what the rules of it were going to be and how this thing was ultimately going to take her over and how you were going to portray that on screen yeah, to be honest, we looked at how Alzheimer's affects people in real life. And obviously it's a disease that can affect people in a number of different ways. So we definitely, and it's, it can be a very slow uh, process too. So we essentially ramped up what could be a 10 year process into a week <laughs> and uh, took it to its supernatural extreme. And I guess in a certain way, trying to capture 
the uncanny sense of someone you love looking the same, but then, you know, feeling like a different person and what happens when you try and physicalize that idea and that emotion. And that's how we, yeah, came up with this kind of deteriorating, uh, you know, body of the loved one who uh, essentially, you know, feels like they become someone else, even though there's like a flicker of who they are inside still there. Yeah, and it's captured so beautifully through your performance, Robin, and particularly the way that you capture that moment that, you know, when people have Alzheimer's, one moment everything's fine and they remember everything, then all of a sudden, within a second, everything can completely switch and change. So were you kind of sitting there in advance with the script, thinking about what her tone and what where she was going to be mentally in each of those moments, or was it something where you really found those moments as you were shooting the scenes? Yeah, gosh, that's a hard question, actually. Well, and Natalie and I talked about Alzheimer's and I did a little bit of research, which wasn't really useful because I thought it was best just to follow this particular character's moment-by-moment uh, moment actions, as you've just described, that from one moment to the next, they can be radically different. Um, I think it, I did think about it, obviously, and when you're learning the script and familiarising yourself with the whole story, you are absorbing and you're developing a kind of understanding of, of how all of those um, moods and behaviours may be manif made manifest. But it was ultimately working in the moment with, uh, with Natalie on set that they were found, yes. No, it's so wonderfully constructed and, you know, I was curious for both of you, Robin and Bella, kind of the environment that Natalie created. I think, you know, you've mentioned that she had a very concise idea of what she wanted and was able to give really clear directions and, and just a little bit about how precisely she would do that when you were working on scenes together because you shot the film in such a short amount of time, so it was important to get to those beats really quickly. Oh my gosh, my, one of my much... favourite moments on set was <laughs> the scene where, um, Natalie, not Natalie, Emily, no, Emily, Robin and I are brushing our teeth together and uh, Natalie was really specific about the angle of the, of the toothbrush and particularly with Robin, like it's to make it kind of feel menacing, like slow. <laughs> Robin came out and was like, this is the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's how specific Natalie would get about things, but also then you watch it and it's great, but at the time you're like, oh my god, no. we're like a gums bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, deep I, apologies. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, worth it. I, I remember doing a, sh a, 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 a shot that uh, I just, I walked from one kitchen counter to another kitchen counter, which is about two paces. And in that, the, the length of time, space of time it took me to walk those two steps, Natalie asked me to do about four or five different moods and expressions. And I was, I, I had a moment of, a momentary resistance. And then I thought, no, this was actually a reshoot. So by then I knew what Natalie was doing and I knew what it meant to respond positively to her directions. So I had an immediate resistance because I thought, oh God, five different, what do you mean? But then I went with it and I tried very hard to do them very specifically. Of course, you know, they never end up on screen, but you do them because they may end up on screen and you, and you will do them if you trust the director. And we mm -hmm. did trust the director, even though the, mm -hmm. the tooth, I've forgotten about the tooth brushing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the angle of the knife when you're holding that well, the angle of the knife. <laughs> yeah oh god that was another one and the, yeah. the scene when i was attacking uh, bella with the knife and i couldn't get it up i could forget i kept forgetting to put it up into the shot and i was carrying it but out of shot how useless is that so we need a director <laughs> <laughs> And it sounds like from the way that everyone talks about being on your set, Natalie, that there was an air of levity, despite the fact that the subject matter itself obviously goes to fairly dark places and, you know, you're pushing your cast to very emotional areas as well. And was that something that was important to you in the way that you wanted to set up the way that everyone was going to communicate and what the overall atmosphere and environment was going to be on the set because of where you were asking them to go day to day? Um, yeah, I guess it's not so much linked to the subject matter. I just prefer a set where everyone's, you know, focused, but... Uh, it's easygoing and everyone's happy to be there and you know you're really working together as a team I think we definitely made sure that the crew were respectful for the actors in uh, yeah you know providing a space that wasn't too boisterous or anything like that when they had to do some really intense scenes but 
I mean, these women are hilarious as well. So I think the humor kind of comes naturally, uh, which is definitely how I prefer to work. Because it's yeah. all, you know, it's all, filmmaking's about people. And so you have to enjoy mm -hmm. it as well, I think. You know, there's so much, there's so many ups and downs in the process. So I think you have to enjoy uh, the day to day. Yeah, my motto, sorry. My, my motto has always been keep the drama on screen. <laughs> Oh, that's good. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> and then, you know, obviously, because it's such an intimate film, it really is just these three characters on screen the majority of the time. It's very rare that we even see anybody else in the film. Was there a different intimacy for all three of you in the way that this film came together and, and the relationships that you had and the way that you communicated compared to other projects that you've worked on because of that? Absolutely for me, yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. I, I did feel that... Um, there was a very there was a very calm and peaceful and uh, easy and confident feeling on set. That's very important, and that came that always comes from the top. Um, and the, yeah, the other two women were the, the other two women apart from the female director were huge fun, very very fun. You spend a lot of time in a makeup bus, obviously, or truck or whatever it's called. I never know which one it is. Um, and always in the makeup tropic, even when Bella was sitting in the makeup chair next to me, still crying from having cried solidly for three days, she's still kind of all crying in the makeup bus. We still had a lot of fun, and that's terribly important. Very positive atmosphere, very supportive. That's great. And we yeah, I think it must have just happened because I don't know, I, I feel like we naturally found that groove, and maybe it is because we we're playing, you know. A mother daughter granddaughter dynamic we just kind of immediately fell into it and maybe it also was I think just that you know that like just laugh to keep from crying if I feel like had we not had that levity we would have just totally fallen apart and just also just being able to laugh at like I remember walking in to Emily like that last scene where she's like peeling the skin and just <laughs> she was just like this is the most horrible thing I've ever had to do and I walked in I walked in and she's sitting there feeling this thing. We looked at each other and we just burst out laughing because it's just like, it's, I mean, what else can you do in that moment? Like, <laughs> And Natalie, you know, kind of to that point of the intimacy of the characters, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the genesis of the story and the characters because, you know, I believe that there were different iterations of the script early on where, you know, at one point Kay had a husband, at one point Sam had a brother. Mm -hmm. And what was that journey of just discovering that these were superfluous characters that really weren't serving the overall narrative structure that you were setting forth to tell? Yeah, I think um, I have a co-writer named Christian White and when he and I wrote the first draft, I think we were coming at it from very much the granddaughter's perspective, just because she was closer in age to us. Um, and then through development, we, I guess we were just more interested in the characters of mother, grandmother and daughter. And it probably felt more natural because of the fact that my grandmother was, you know, my maternal grandmother. And so there was already that, you know, tri-generational factor. And I guess, you know, naturally there's something in seeing your grandparent declining that makes you think about, you know, your mother after that, and then by extension yourself and your own mortality. So I really liked that cyclical nature that just felt cleaner without kind of peripheral characters. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, it was just the most interesting stuff that was happening in the writing. So we decided to just simplify it. Yeah, and in terms of the way that you've constructed this world then visually on screen, you've done such a beautiful job. You know, everything from the lighting choices, the color palette that we see on screen, the location of the house that you choose and the way it was set decorated. There's so many specific tiny details in every single scene and every moment that you look at. So kind of what was your process of just creating what you wanted the overall visual aesthetic of the film to be to really tie together that story and create that overall tone? Yeah, I mean, we, it was really important throughout that the house had a real sense of history and our production designer, Stephen Jones Evans, just did the most wonderful job, you know, layering this house with, um, yeah, just decades and decades of memories, essentially. And that the idea of this house kind of being emblematic of, I guess, Edna's memories, her mind, you know, everything she's held dear, uh, she's held dear and everything that's kind of slipping away. That was so, you know, key to the, the film and the whole emotion driving the film. So uh, we really wanted a sense that um, there was something 
really familiar about the place as well. You know, it wasn't kind of a stereotypical haunted house where there's dark walls and it's kind of, uh, mm. you know, like a Gothic mansion vibe at all. It, it, you know, in terms of the color palettes, we went with a lot of creams and blushes and stuff that kind of felt benign to begin with, but then was slowly mm. kind of edging into the unfamiliar. And, you know, there's this real sense of decay as the you yeah. know, story went on. So, yeah, I think, um, that was really important in terms of like the cinematography. I guess there's a sense that the palette is almost like a faded photograph. Um, we went with kind of a cooler look that was slightly desaturated and that kind of spoke to the, um, the winter setting and the coldness of the house and this, this sense of coldness that Edna describes coming into the house as well. So yeah, those are some of the things I could keep going, but <laughs> yeah just stop me whenever <laughs> you spent years thinking about that every single detail <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> and yeah. once the three of you were all in that pre-production process in terms of just really navigating what the story beats and and what the flow and arc of each of these characters were going to be together what did that process look like did you have much time before you started shooting to spend with each other to have those conversations or was it really something where once you were filming you had to just like move forward and find those beats within the moment as you were shooting I definitely don't recall talking about uh, beats and arcs and stuff, but I do remember, like, we had a few days where we just sat and discussed our characters, right, Natalie or Robin? Yeah, Definitely and I think up. we just discussed ourselves and our life experience mm. and, and tried to find common ground. And I think just being really open with each other makes it easier to talk about that kind of stuff on set you kind of develop a bit of a language about it so yeah these guys didn't really have a lot of time together emily in particular when her flight was delayed for two days so she was <laughs> really, really had to take around stuck running. somewhere yeah yeah it was like three days before we shot that she arrived i'm pretty sure so it was i feel nice. like i do that i mean i don't know if it's conscious or unconscious but i feel like i do that going into a project anyway i just um especially a project like this like I just let everyone know like all my trauma like here are all the buttons if you need to push one because I'm not delivering like <laughs> this happened this happened this happened just mention any of these trigger words and I will unravel so uh go for it and that person. horrible uh coincidence with the set dressing when you were in the labyrinth oh, God, never forget <laughs> that that was just brutal essentially Oh, I don't know if you want to tell the story or not. Oh, no, there was a, like, right at the end where I'm in the crawl space and I'm, like, really, like, completely unraveling. And that was, I don't know, a couple of days into the shooting the labyrinth stuff where I was just completely unraveling. Just as I kind of got to the crawl space, there was a photo which was used to set dressing of my mother who's deceased. And I just was like, why is this even here? I actually thought Natalie had, like, placed it there just to, like... Just pulling the strings. I mean, great idea. If I were a director, I'd probably do the same, to be honest, which is no why way. I thought that. Um, but I remember just <laughs> really losing it at that point. I was like, this isn't even going to be on camera. Why is this photo here? <laughs> Can I just say yeah. something about that, um, the, 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 how we kind of started the process? Mm -hmm. We did have kind of chats together and, and they were very useful because none of us knew each other. But I kind of find with a project like that, that being on the set in the clothes with the hair and the look is so important because I play so many different characters. This one was very, they're all very specific. This one was particularly specific. Um, and to be in the world, which was so affecting her, was more important to me than, than having a rehearsal in a rehearsal space. So I'm very glad we actually didn't do that because once you get the clothes on and the hair's done and the makeup and you're in, you're in the, the character's world, and it was Edna's world, um, you know, really, um, it, that, that really fed everything. So that to me was a very much, you know, it was a, a very cool choice. To use Emily Mortimer's word, it was cool. <laughs> she's not here so i'm speaking for her <laughs> she's always saying it's cool such a cool movie yeah, cool cool she's so cool, cool. cool yeah, she's woman so yeah cool. yeah so cool <laughs> 
<laughs> and Bella, because you were just mentioning that scene where you're going into the crawl space, which is obviously part of the emotional crux and, and crescendo for your character in, in particular. And you do such a fantastic job at really capturing that heightened sense of drama, creating that sense of fear for the audience in the moment, but also it feels completely grounded within Sam's emotional relationship with her grandmother at that point as well. It doesn't feel like it's completely separate from that. Is that something that you have to think about consciously or does it really just come from the script and from the direction that you're getting from Natalie in those moments to balance those two very different aspects into your performance? I think script and direction. I mean, I think all of the labyrinth stuff yeah. was like the hardest and the easiest because it was there. I mean, that crawl space thing, like you've got a wall closing in on you. It's pretty easy to just freak out and not think about like, oh, I don't know, not overthink it. Uh, I think if anything, I recall Natalie and I talking about tr finding moments in that labyrinth where I wasn't just kind of sobbing and unraveling, like try finding moments of like, strength okay like I'm gonna go on and um just keep moving forward or you know like moments where you find new resilience or whatever like trying to find different I guess beats in that um yeah. but that was totally that was Natalie because otherwise I probably would have just spent the whole thing crying I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and then with, with your performance at that point in the movie, Robin, it's such a fascinating trajectory performance-wise because we go from seeing you in one iteration to something very different by the end, and there is that kind of gradual disarray in her mind as she gets taken over and ultimately at the beginning we still recognize her and by the end it's something completely different. So, you know, was that something that was conscious decision making along the way for you or kind of what you were just saying where like the difference and the change in the characters and the physicality really just lent itself to figuring that all out? Well, the, the prosthetics made a huge difference. I mean, yeah. once you're locked into all of that, that rubber, um, the mask, um, even, I've, I've only seen the film twice. The first time I saw it at Sundance and I couldn't see anything, I was just tense. The second time I saw it, I just found that so horrible looking at myself with all of this, uh, the prosthetics on, it was very frightening and to see the eyes in there, it was very, very frightening. So that does a lot of the work for you, you know, and also technically you're coping with wearing that, carrying it and wearing it, it's, it's awkward and uncomfortable. So a, a lot of the, the movie work is done, the storytelling is done by that physicality that you're looking at that's been created by, by prosthetic artists. Um, but yes, of course, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an actress, so I acted as necessary in, in all of the different conditions and states, which were, again, very clearly written. And, and the, the progression of the story is so clear that if you follow it with your head, you kind of, then you act it, <laughs> sort of follows naturally. Yeah. Sort of, sort but I think of. you did such a beautiful job in balancing, you know, Edna's vulnerability, even in towards the end with the, you know, the, the menace um, that mm. she shows as well. And um, even in the bathtub scene, when she's starting to peel away mm. the skin, you know, there's a sense you, you get, I feel like you, you feel the urge to, um, I guess, un, un reveal or uncover, there's like an itchiness to the skin or something that mm. she's trying to get rid of. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel like you you did that brilliantly. But yeah. anyway, oh. cr much credit to you um, within the prosthetics, yeah. <laughs> and then Natalie, I feel like it would be remiss not to talk about that really powerful final scene. You've done such a stunning job in it. And I feel like that's the thing that everybody really holds on to and sits thinking about when they step away from this movie. And, um, you know, I believe that Robin wasn't actually even there, but she had to go through pros prosthetics for that skeleton figure to be made. And which must have been even more of a challenge in terms of filming it because you don't have that scene partner for Emily. So what was that process for you in terms of just like setting it up and making sure that you were capturing you know, that final physical manifestation, but also that it really was capturing the emotional essence that you really wanted to portray and convey with the end of the film. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that's why I love practical effects so much because it does give the actor something to play off. And if you saw the puppet, I mean, it's on screen there. It, it really did have emotion. And it was, mm. it was of course, sculpted based off of Robin's bone structure and, and face um, to have that uh you know like likeness um but yeah the the guys who who made it they they sculpted this beautiful puppet with animatronics and there were two guys um who had basically like 
a uh, car, toy car, remote controllers, uh, and they could control kind of every muscle in the mm -hmm. face. And yeah, the nuance that they could capture was really incredible. Um, mm -hmm. There was also a breathing mechanism as well. So it would kind of go mm -hmm. in, and, in and out. Um, so yeah, to a certain degree, it's, it's a little bit ludicrous and there's, you know, skin peeled everywhere, but I feel like Emily was so in it. And um, mm. yeah, I, I think she had a real kind of, not reverence, but she really, uh, obviously connected with the, the beauty of the puppet itself as well. So mm. I thought there was a sort of yeah. reverence actually. Mm. I, I thought, of, I think actually reverence is a very good word for that, for, for her, for the way she responded with such, mm. such love. It was kind so delicate. I thought it was a kind of reverence. I think that's a beautiful mm. word for it. Mm. Yeah. I wanted to jump into some of the audience questions that we have been getting from everybody. Um, and this one question is, while the film obviously isn't a COVID film, the New York Times talked about how this film and a few others right now are touching on the horror of isolation and this being very timely. And how do you all feel about this as being the reception to the movie? I mean, yeah, I, I, obviously it wasn't uh, even, it, you know, a part of a reality, our reality when um, I wrote, uh, we wrote and uh, shot the film. But I feel like at the moment it really resonates just in terms of how we treat our elderly as well. And that feels like something that, you know, they're the most vulnerable um, and at risk at, at this moment. So yeah. it, it, um, yeah, I think it has new, it has new layers in some ways. Yeah, um, and then this next question is for the two of you, Robin and Bella. As an actor who's literally scared of my own shadow but loves horror, are there any techniques you use when acting so you don't get creeped out and get scared during the scary scenes that you're shooting? God, I think you have to get creeped out and scared in the scary scenes. I mean, I do remember to, <laughs> I do remember like texting with my therapist being like, I can't handle this. And she's like, of course you can. And I'm like, what else are you using all that trauma for? You may as well channel it into something positive. <laughs> but I definitely don't feel like I was, um, I don't, I don't know how to, I'm sure there are people who are more skilled than, than I am who can kind of do it in a way that's more protective to their own psyche. But I think in, I just had to be really scared. Uh, and I think even, even even if I wasn't, I think at a certain point, if you just keep crying, your nervous system believes the signals that it's uh, receiving. So, yeah, uh, I think I've just spent a fair chunk of that film just terrified. I think I remember. Oh yeah. I I, I I think I think you have to go where you have to go. You have to go where the mm. script tells you to go. If you're in good hands. If you're not, mm. then. It might be, you know, the resi a, 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 an internal resistance may, may affect you. Uh, but I also think a lot of it, you know, has to be te technical. You have to have, you know, you, you're protected by technique. You're also protected by the fact that it's not real. So the minute you stop acting, yeah. you know, there, there's a joke to be had. There are friends, there's cups of tea and there are people around yeah. you. So you are in a safe space. Well, hopefully not every set is a safe set. But ours was a very safe set. You feel safe, you go there. Yeah. Um, and this one's a little bit of a follow on to obviously the fact that we are in quarantine. There's that isolation theme of saying, you know, asking about the fact that the film was originally supposed to be playing cinemas and what it feels like to have a film now that's being released in the middle of the pandemic and really thriving at drive in cinema because that's, there's been such a huge resurgence of that. Yeah, no, it's certainly an unexpected upside. You know, IFC were really decisive with releasing in, in July and saying, look, there's yeah. going to be a gap with all the studio releases being pushed back. Let's just make the most of it. And so to their credit, it's been an incredible run um, and it's yeah. gotten, you know, exposure that I'm sure it wouldn't have uh, in any other case. And in Australia as well, we were supposed to do a, a small theatrical run, but instead we've... Uh, gone on to one of our biggest streaming platforms here and that's just been amazing to just share it with more people and you know have everyone watch it together it's been it's been great and safe for everyone of course that's really wonderful and then someone else was asking you Natalie about what it was like to work with the Russo brothers ex as executive producers for the film yeah they were great I um they came on board when we'd already had the script kind of close to shooting stage nice. uh, and we had a few meetings with them just in pre-production to kind of present to them what we were doing they're very hands-off on the shoot they actually sent down an executive 
uh, who I thought was going to be like a minder kind of looking over my shoulder, but he was the complete opposite. He was just really supportive and just doing a lot of these and yeah, he's great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then they were probably most involved in posts. So we actually did, you know, a director's cut and we went over to LA to do three weeks of post with them, uh, which was great because all, you know, when you work remotely in post, it can become a bit of a headache kind of having notes back and forth. So mm. having the conversations in the room, I would say Joe Russo was probably more involved directly. Um, but yeah, it's great having EPs who are filmmakers because they can also provide solutions and not just problems. Mm. So that's really helpful. Yeah, and then, you know, I just wanted to kind of wrap up by asking each of you a little bit about, for you individually, what was the most challenging scene for each of you to film that was kind of your personal accomplishment looking back at it now, if there was one? Yeah, for me, it was the scene in the forest when Edna goes to bury the photographs. Uh, she eats the photographs and then and tries to bury them and she has a scene with her daughter, um, Kay, which is, which, which is, very difficult to do, particularly because it was so hard kneeling for all of that time in the mud. But it, it was it was it was extremely emotional and very diff, very difficult. But uh, but but I, you know, and it was beautiful to do with Emily. She's such a sweetheart. So that was the hard one for me. Uh, it's a toss up between I mean, any scene that took place in the labyrinth. Uh, and the dancing scene with Robin. <laughs> <laughs> but it came out so beautifully. <laughs> so awkward on the oh, day. Okay. Trying to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, trying that, to that's dance the horror. the cha-cha. For me, that was the horror. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't learn it. I couldn't learn the cha-cha or whatever it was. <laughs> what was it? Actually? It was supposed to be a little bit awkward. <laughs> That's interesting. Both uh, those scenes that they've described were challenging for me for different reasons. I would say the photo bearing scene for emotional reasons. That scene was probably one of the hardest to write. And we actually, if you remember, Robin, we rewrote some parts of it the day before we shot it after workshopping some stuff. Um, and I was in tears behind the monitor. It was, oh. it was pretty um, intense. And then the labyrinth scenes with Bella were really tricky just because uh, the nature of the set was really hard to shoot in because of course it was diminishing mm. and we were really short on time because we'd had to shift some stuff around. So that was like the end of the schedule, the last like five days of shooting. Um, and we just had to go through it so quickly. And, you know, with mm. Bella have to, having to be so high and um, emotionally, it was it was a real, uh, yeah, uh, marathon, I felt. I'm trying light parts of it, like be like emotionally um, honest, but also trying to light some of it with the iPhone. So it's like, go again, can you lift the phone a bit? Like, can you angle it? But like, but be emotionally honest, but also can you just angle it? If you just, if you just hold it here and it just feels so foreign, like to run with like the talk, like if everything is stopped being like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you've all done such a fantastic job. So thank you so much to Natalie, Robin and Bella for joining us. And thank you for everyone who, watching this evening. And thank you to IFC Midnight and North Bend Film Festival for co-hosting this event with us tonight. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. So Thanks, Mara.